I'd like to go over some of the practices and operation maintenance pieces that we put into farm plans, but also to make um, some points of pieces or components that uh, farmers could use, tips to help them identify issues or problems or help them um, fix things before it becomes a problem. Uh, uh, last month we talked about irrigation uh, water and so I'm going to start this going through irrigation steps and uh, understanding the pieces of irrigation system that be because a lot of our manure is applied through irrigation systems. It is part of the design of that uh, system that uh, is in the ground and then the operation and maintenance of that system and keeping that up to date. Uh, setting a system up for a pipeline, PVC pipes are usually rated 160, 200 PSI. The um, design of those systems are usually based on uh, a producer's equipment that's available. Uh, inventorying that equipment, coming up with uh, uh, application spacings and rates for gallons per minute that are available to help uh, come up with a design on that pipe, but then using the specifications that we have um, provided by um, companies that sell the Nelson big guns or uh, injection systems have different rates of application, different pressures that uh, go into the design of the pipeline. Um, on this typical spreadsheet, we're using uh, uh, the, the wetted diameter would be the um, 280 feet on here. That uh, that'd be where the sprinkler would hit the. Uh, Things like filter strips or, or, or application setbacks would be added to that 80, 280 foot, so you'd have a 40 foot application setback if you're using manure. But the actual uh, tow path, the set for the riser would be 210 feet because of the efficiency and overlap we want to provide uh, to get a good coverage in between those uh, poles. This is critical when we're looking at the irrigation systems when they throw out the uh, uh, irrigation needs of a crop and trying to meet that crop's needs and trying to understand that the, the tow path is something that uh, it, it needs to be adjusted for wind and for um, sprinkler type. So the rates and, and talking about units, one inch for irrigation is 27,000 gallons per acre. Typically our manure applications are 10,000 to 15,000 gallons an acre. So half an inch, a third an inch. So the question? Yeah, I, in the last slide is, you had a note there that it was 65% efficient from the bottom. Yes. That seems pretty low to me. Uh, big gun applications have a lot of drift associated with the application at the pressures that are being applied through the nozzle. Um, the amount of water that actually hits the ground or hits goes into the soil, 65% uh, comes off of a book value that we um, found in an irrigation guide. You can go to, uh, and the, we're talking about water uh, being applied hitting the ground being available for the plant. And so we went through some of that last month, but that efficiency increases as you go to say an injection system to get more water in the system and then a drip system that doesn't uh, allow the water to be uh, exposed to the atmosphere. The, uh, and again, this goes into the inventory of the system to try to get the maximum to the plant. So that this is an inventory of what's existing on that farm. The uh, application rates, again, uh, most farms are set up around manure where the application rates are, are less than irrigation rates. The irrigation rate of an inch of water is, is a typical number for uh, a 10 hour set on a big gun. The idea that uh, that rate is far more than what is in uh, 
uh, expected in an uh, application system for a manure means that our designs change back and forth on whether you're applying manure or applying rain or irrigation water. Uh, this also shows a chart for uh, the travel speed of the gun. So if you are looking at your uh, hose reel, you can uh, mark your reel and measure how fast it is being pulled in and go back to a chart such as this to determine the application. And this is part of the spec for uh, the irrigation system. Uh, the components, there's lots of components that goes into our designs. A lot of those uh, pieces include things like thrust blocks to get, protect the system from uh, coming apart, but also uh, max or minimum depth for uh, installing a uh, pipe so it protects it from uh, typical tillage in our systems with uh, deep ripping or uh, subsoiling. The, uh, Arm systems, like we do apply or use an arm with a traction valve to protect the system as well. Those uh, components aren't always uh, thought of when a farmer's just putting it in on their own. And so that, that extra piece of safety protects that from a water hammer and uh, overpressuring the line and protect your pumps if you're turning on a pump at full. Uh, application rate. Caps for uh, one of the pieces for safety reasons we put in a, a ball valve to release the gas pressure in our manure pipelines it seems we oftentimes have methane buildup inside of that pipeline and by taking off the ring lock that cap can actually fly into the air and, and uh, injure people and it has happened in the past. Uh, the ball valve, it's uh, a rather large ball valve to be able to release the gas and they actually do plug up as well. Uh, so it's a piece of the system that needs to be uh, installed. We've had people actually use the ball valves to get large enough ball valves to be able to hook the irrigation to that, take off the cap for applying manure in a uh, newer and irrigation system. The uh, location of the riser cap in the ground uh, protects it somewhat from uh, if you bury it deep enough it'll uh, you can go over the top of it with an injector usually add a cap on top of that to uh, allow the hose to travel past. Others have uh, elevated risers and protect it from uh, being damaged by animals rubbing against them. Traction valves, there's two, one on the arm here, and the second is actually built right into the cap. We've had different uh, companies do different ways. The traction valve actually has a piece or markings on it that is supposed to be screwed down tight enough to get to the pressure rating of the system. So that's an important operation step to install these is, is to get that uh, traction valve dialed down to the, uh, the spec of that pipe. Again, 160 or 200 psi pipe isn't, uh, we don't want this at 160, there's actually a safety factor that's designed into the system to crank that down a little bit uh, lower so that you're protecting that system. Uh, check valves and backflow prevention. Hooking to irrigation systems and manure systems, you can have backflow issues with when they're going down the well. So put backflow uh, prevention is critical. Uh, the chemigation, fertigation systems actually require a double check valve system with an inspection port uh, to meet uh, regulations for injecting chemical into uh, irrigation system. The uh, foot valve does not, uh, down the side of the well, does not count as part of that double check valve system. So you are required to have two uh, backflow prevention devices on this system. Uh, air vac 
One of the things that we have with pumps hooked to solid pipe with a flex hose, you'll actually have the flex hose squeeze down every time it's shut down. If you don't have an air vac right next to that, it uh, will end up leaking and, and causing trouble. This air vac uh, allowed when it was connected to the pipe to uh, blow off or, or suck out air to prevent it from damaging the system. Uh, again, the manure systems have a lot of solids in them, and so air vacs for solids built up into the rubber uh, protecting the system. Again, having this manure going into a ditch would be a, an issue. This actually is going back into the lagoon, but understanding that. These kind of systems do leak and they are messy, so <coughs> they need to be protected from being too close to water bodies or environmentally sensitive areas. Uh, setting up a design for a pipeline with thrust blocks, being able to protect again that uh, pipe from moving in the ground when it is being uh, activated or deactivated uh, with a water hammer or, or just uh, shut off. The, uh, the epoxy coating on the riser keeps it from rotting or, or deteriorating, uh, rusting. Uh, the bolts connecting to that uh, system, uh, they typically are just encoded and going to stainless steel, especially on our acidic soil, will help from those being um, an issue. <coughs> Intake rates of the soils uh, for actually applying irrigation water and manure, their intake rates based on book values for the soils that we have. The idea that uh, every system is a little different, so it depends on the crop, it depends on the tillage practice, depends on uh, the uh, soil organic matter and other things. There is a, a coefficient that comes in, but the actual soil type, it, it does have uh, a basic uh, intake rate that is is uh, using the calculation for how much can be applied at one time. When uh, looking at the application <coughs> amount in uh, inches per acre, so if you're applying uh, a certain amount of gallons, and again the typical number would be uh, half inch would be 13,500 gallon. The maximum intake rate in inches per hour is 1.45. To get to that number, 593 gallons per minute, if you're applying more than that, will probably cause it to pond on the surface. The issues come if it is raining or if that runs down hill, it can again reach a sensitive water body. So understanding that the soil type and the structure and vegetative practices all play into pieces of the uh, infiltration rate, how much you can apply to uh, design around a system for uh, sizing a pipe, sizing pumps, getting those pieces worked into uh, the system for applying manure and irrigation water efficiently for the maximum or, or the producer's goal, uh, yield goal. Um, if you have runoff, you can have it again go downhill and, and it does cause a problem. Um, one of the things with filter strips and ve vegetative treatment areas, we've come up with setbacks for applying manure. At one time we were basing that uh, solely on the NRCS filter strip standard. The filter strip was duly used as a setback and a vegetated treatment area. Now the standard for vegetated treatment area is specifically for runoff control from an area um, and it's based on slope and nutrient content of what is uh, entering that area. It's not a filter strip along the edge of a s s 
of a field. So uh, this vegetative treatment area and filter strips are not necessarily interchangeable in the terms of NRCF. Uh, silage use collection systems where uh, the silage juice is, is collected into uh, uh, catch basins or pump system and being able to uh, store that until it can be applied agronomically is the language in which the federal CAFO rules stand on silage juice. Silage juice, because it's acidic and it has sugar in it, it has a concern for um, entering a surface water body. You can, and uh, the BOD concern, which can cause uh, biological oxygen demand to uh, uh, remove oxygen from the water for fish, and it can have a problem with killing fish. The uh, use of a filter strip or vegetated treatment area in that case, if it does not reach the surface water, and it, it does infiltrate based on properties of the soil, the question is nutrient content of that material. Typically, silage juice, when it comes out directly out of the bunker, it's going to have high concentrations, but it's usually low volume at the time of harvest, especially grass silage, but corn silage as well. In some cases, though, corn silage can go up wet and have a very high acid content. And if it's high volume and high acid, you can have a burn on your plants and it actually will uh, destroy or, or contaminate the filter area. And by killing that vegetation, there's no longer a, a, an agronomic need for that. The plants have died. So trying to control that silage leachate during the time when it's most potent, get that into the waste storage system, and then use your filter strip when it's more or more dilute or, or less concentrated, being able to understand that corn silage and grass silage still have nutrients in them, so we need something out there growing to take that up. But to harvest that material, this time of year is especially uh, the time when we want to divert water away from those treatment areas and get them so they're growing and uh, they're prepared for the fall for harvest time. The uh, areas are usually uh, mismanaged or uh, abused a little bit, being an area next to a bunker where there's a lot of traffic during uh, a very intense time of, of putting up silage and, and moving, uh, covering the tires or, or uh, tarps. And so there's usually a little bit of an area that uh, needs to be addressed this time of year going into the fall to prepare it for the uh, in, uh, harvest time. It's recommended to uh, get some grass growing on there so it may be, there may be a need for uh, <coughs> grading or uh, harrowing or roughing up that area and getting some seed out there to be able to have that plant grow during the uh, later summer, early fall. Uh, there is an assessment tool uh, from WSU that's put out there to address your silage leachate if you're uh, collecting it or, or managing it well. Uh, it is uh, endorsed by the Department of Agriculture uh, as part of uh, keeping in with the nutrient management law. <coughs> Um, silage juice is acidic and so when you are in a bunker situation there's a concrete is basic and the two don't go together very well and it will deteriorate silos made out of concrete. A lot of uh, producers have went to asphalt um, in their silos to be able to uh, reduce that um, uh, deterioration and so there is uh, uh, still collection need for that material and uh, diverting that with the concrete or asphalt is important. Setting up concrete, whether it's for manure storage or for uh, uh, silage bunkers, 
Uh, we have a six inch concrete recommendation that uh, a lot of farmers believe it is excessive, but in our high uh, intense farms with large equipment, it's very important to understand that that concrete is going to break. It's going to crack. It doesn't, uh, it, it's, it's not going to last forever, but it, if you have the uh, construction joints in the right place with rebar and the right amount of cover over the rebar, you'll have a longer lasting material and surface to work with. Um, our recommendation on 18 inch, uh, half inch rebar, 18 inches on center, excuse me. Uh, the requirement for six inches is based off of a concrete uh, standard that you have three inches on the exposed side and two <coughs> inches of uh, concrete on the um, material side. So with a stack of half inch double you know, grid, that's six inches total of, of concrete necessary to meet that standard. But again, it's to protect the, the rebar from corrosion and have, uh, when it does crack, have structure in it to keep that concrete together. Um, dry stacks are one way to keep roof water uh, or runoff off the material. Um, walls, concrete walls all the way to to uh, ecology blocks are something that uh, need to be looked at. The ecology blocks for stability, we recommend that, that uh, no more than two blocks above ground level. So if you have three blocks high, you build a burn behind the third one. Uh, it also helps with uh, leachate or uh, water going through that bunker. Uh, roof water management to control the runoff off the roof and uh, put it into a pipe and outlet it safely. It's important to understand the design of the roof, the area that you're collecting, and then being able to clean those out. And this is an example of a clean out on the pipe. Uh, manure lagoons, uh, the managed mowing the dikes, and managing the solids in them, the uh, issues that we see with manure lagoons this time of year as they get uh, pulled down. It's important to be inspecting those this time of year. We've got dry weather. We can do construction if we need to. Uh, the agitator issues with uh, the uh, overuse of an agitator close to the bank, uh, scouring, making a scour hole, we need to be able to go back in there, or we, the producers need to go in there and get that cleaned out, repacked with clay, uh, do the maintenance on their waste storage structures. It's a valuable investment that needs to be addressed on, and at least evaluated on an annual basis by themselves. For the cost share practices or cost share programs the in the future, that's going to be an uh, important piece of the inventory of the farm is evaluating the waste storage structures. Uh, NRCS would like to see those structured empty and full, so prior to signing up or being able to sign up for uh, the Environmental Quality Incentive Program or EQIP program, we're asking to have farmers uh, call us so we can get that evaluation done ahead of the sign up so that we know what we're getting into. Uh, the requirement for that uh, assessment and uh, practices that need to go into waste storage is, is a piece of the inventory of the farm now. Uh, Rolling holes is something that uh, does happen almost uh, every year we, we get calls about uh, producers when they have uh, Field their lagoon, sometimes above the, the freeboard mark, but uh, in that top area where um, the road <coughs> may have uh, dug a hole, it will actually uh, siphon manure back out, or, or manure will have a, uh, an opportunity to, to flow out of the lagoon without actually running over the top. So it'll appear that you'll have 
uh, a leak or uh, a problem lower in the dike when it was actually all the way up to the top or close to the top and that's where uh, or when if you uh, lower the lagoon level you can get uh, the problem to stop being able to go in there and address it during a dry period excavating that over over excavating those areas uh, compacting it back with uh, suitable material getting topsoil put back on top of that and uh, a crop or a grass growing is important that time sequence of that uh, activity though is usually not in February or when when these are usually identified so uh, keeping the lagoon banks mowed down and uh, uh, observed frequently will help uh, you identify if there's a problem with rodents anybody have any questions you fall asleep <laughs> I'm going to track it around the dike in the morning, get the clothes up there. Will it? I think the activity actually helps uh, address or see the problem if there is a problem. I don't know if it will keep them at bay. I know that there are uh, some farms that may be more successful at it than others. The idea that the uh, vibration of the mower or noise or activity will keep some of those rodents out, uh, but we have that skunk issues or uh, you know, dens of an larger animals that will come in even when it's been mowed, but um, it seems like it, it's a lot more reduced in, in those areas that are well kept. Was it, was it confirmed that it was a mole at one of the ponds uh, further there was a problem? Most of the time it's been a mole, and, but I have seen skunks, rats, other animals. You say so. You said usually it's been a mole. Usually it's been mole, mole spread. Yeah, that would be pretty hard then, to, 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 you know, since they're subterranean and they're kind of looking for worms and stuff. I can see with mice, you know, because they don't really want, you know, short grass is really good. Yeah, I did. Uh, there's different ways to control moles with uh, chemical or, or noise makers and different things and, and people have tried different ones. And Can you talk about the pros and cons of uh, using animals to graze on your lagoon dikes and what some of the issues may occur there? Uh, pros and cons for using animals to graze the lagoon dike. Uh, the fence is the first one that comes to mind. There uh, needs to be a fence on lagoons that are less than five feet for protection of safety, but if you're going to have animals on it, you're going to need to have a fence, which means that the uh, um, agitation uh, access may be limited. Once you get into, uh, if, if you have a small enough lagoon where that's not an issue, just the animal traffic and, and cows usually like to uh, uh, dig in dirt or, or rub in dirt and they'll end up making a hole and digging a hole and, and making it worse and no matter how often you feel that, they'll go back at that. Uh, with the lagoon being too wet, you can actually pock holes, just indent with their hooves. Um, usually it's too wet in our area until late enough in the year 
that the grass is actually overgrown, that the animals won't graze it very well. So it, it's past the time when they'll graze it appropriately. So it's a little difficult usually that first time to graze it. Um, but that extra long grass is, when, when they go in and lay it down, they can actually uh, um, make the road nest or, or, or cover some of the areas that we're talking about being a problem. Uh, the con, or excuse me, the pros are, are that you can mow steeper hillsides. Some of the some of the lagoon banks are very steep, and it's difficult to mow them. And some of the uh, lagoons we have built have had uh, shallower slopes on the outside, so farmers can farm right up to the edge of the lagoon, and, and so getting that dry matter off for the grazing animals. Do you want to talk about <clears throat> some of the criteria when you make a lagoon evaluation? The lagoon evaluation. Eric, you ran away. No. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, so, NRCS has uh, uh, released a and the evaluation for waste storage ponds that looks at the criteria when the lagoon was built, whether it's been maintained or modified since the time it was built, and uh, the area that uh, in the state that it was built to, to evaluate whether it's a high risk for potential problems. Uh, Whatcom County, most of our dairy area were in the high risk for groundwater sensitive uh, zone and so we're already in one level of, of uh, a ri higher risk or medium risk area. Once you go to uh, not having a lagoon built to NRCS standards, it pushes you up even higher. So if you don't have uh, NRCS's uh, as built on that lagoon that, that pushes the evaluation tool higher. If you've made a modification since it was built, that pushes you higher. The operation and maintenance pieces that are uh, identified in the evaluation tool include the bank stable, um, the <coughs> vegetation growing on the bank, the uh, vents, the inside interior does it have visual signs of erosion and most ponds have those issues uh, at some degree uh, the fill the spillway the uh, issues with uh, a new uh, inflow and not having a spillway can cause erosion and that evaluation tool puts you into a higher risk and by being in high risk, it uh, recommends to have work done on that waste storage facility before you continue to use it. And that it becomes an issue with um, the cost share program for one, but the way that uh, NRCS looks at existing storage plans. <coughs> Does the inspector have any uh, these guys have any reference? I'm sorry. You know, when he's he's evaluating the plans, are those things that he's looking at? Does the inspector? I, I can't answer that. That's why I knew you were here. Right, yeah. generally not to the level of specificity of the NSGS yes. criteria goes to in terms of evaluation. Well, just a, we're, look, I'm, we're looking at some more basic things. I mean, obvious erosion, where it looks like there's uh, signs of embankment, problematic either interior or exterior, um, excessive vegetation, so you simply can't observe if there is a problem, um, and, and clear or extensive growing activity. Um, the things that we primarily uh, will look at if, if it's really clear that it's been overly full. But 
when we're looking at some of the more obvious signs of like problems. And some of the more maybe more simple maintenance issues getting into um cool cool results out that there's excessive erosion from a being hit by Maybe you can talk about um, like inside slope and kind of what you're looking at and how to fix those issues if it's too steep and it doesn't mean there's this spots. The uh, criteria for waste storage pond it has been the combination of five to one slope between the outside and the inside uh, since the design standard came about. The, uh, the five to one uh, slope allows for stability <coughs> of the structure. The inside slope minimum is two to one unless other uh, uh, things address issues such as safety. And so two to one slope at the minimum uh, is a challenge for the contractors to get clay on it so that they are having, they would like to see that slope a little less for compaction on the clay. But once you go in there to excavate out or clean out the lagoon and clean out this, the solids buildup, the original toad and uh, dimensions of that waste storage pond are expected to be uh, rebuilt. The uh, difficulty of getting two to one slope or if an excavator cleans out too far is that it will um, cut into the liner or the seal that is on the waste storage pond. And again, it, changing this, once, once you modify that wall, you can end up uh, no longer being grandfathered in to the design standard at which it was built. So there's challenge from um, changing the system and then uh, actually doing the work. The, uh, the structure of, of that two to one slope again is to keep stability on the inside as well. So if when the water does come up against it, it, does, uh, doesn't, it doesn't erode the bank and it, uh, you're able to crawl out of it if you did fall in. If a producer does modify their lagoon on their own, what is the consequence of that and what's the outcome? <coughs> The modification of the lagoon without uh, with, without NRCS's approval or uh, acceptance of that lagoon would mean that it would not be able to be used in their nutrient management plan unless it was certified by a professional engineer outside of NRCS. 